Welcome to Bethel Cleveland's Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy today's message. For more information on this podcast or how to get connected, go to BethelCleveland.com. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. It is really good to be with you today. I have good news for you. I think the Lord has a word for you today. Amen. Can you put your hands out like you're going to receive something? Unless the basket's, you know, being put in your hand, then just be careful, you know. Um, Lord, we just turn our attention towards you right now. We're not in a, a rush. We're putting the brakes on the normal frantic pace of life right now in culture. And we're saying that right here, right now, we are listening. We are engaging. Come on, just take a deep breath. Let it all out. Some of you are walking around and you are flexing so hard and it's not on purpose. <laughs> Just relax. The Lord has something for you today and a seat at his table. Lord, I bless every person have open ears, open hearts, and that you pour out your spirit on them and just waves throughout this whole morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I've been thinking a lot about that lately. And a lot of times, I feel like it's just me. I feel like I'm the only one whose brain is always kind of racing onto the next thing and running and hustling. But I think that's pretty much all of us, right? We're all pretty much feeling that right now. This plugged in, just full speed, really fast culture. And it, it gave me this picture. I was asking the Lord this morning. I was like, Lord, can you give me like something that's not in the notes, something that I can think of that'll encourage people. And it, it just took me back to this time I was in high school and I went jet skiing for the first time. Anyone ever gone jet skiing before? Now, it wasn't fancy here. We didn't have the skis. I did it barefoot. <laughs> so you know how that feels if you've done that before. <laughs> but um, we're just, we're flying on this, this tube. I get on my feet and I can feel it stinging my feet as we're going. And then um, all of a sudden, like I lose my grip and I go flying through the air. Like, I just remember looking up and I see my feet in the sky and I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> and I slammed into the water and have you ever been hit so hard that you can't breathe for like 30 seconds? Just wind knocked out of me. And I'm coming to the surface and I come up and of course the boat's kind of far away. I think that the guy driving might have been, a, you know, a little not under the influence of the spirit, maybe something else. Um, <laughs> But he was driving off and I, and I was just sinking into the water and the Lord gave me this picture that a lot of us, when it comes to him, we've got our eyes on the boat and we've got our eyes on where we're going and we are holding on and we're trying to zip across the water, right? And we feel the sting on our feet and things are just moving so fast and we're just hanging on so tight. But we weren't designed to live that way. And the Lord invites us to come to a place, maybe not in the same way where you get thrown into the air with your feet over your ears and you can't breathe. <laughs> maybe for some of you. <laughs> but maybe there comes a place where we're not on the surface, just focus on where we're going sometimes. Sometimes we can sink in to, to where God is, just sink into the water that beneath your feet, you're, you're kind of surfing and jet skiing so fast, but beneath your feet, there's a whole ecosystem, a whole life. And God has something like that for you in the spirit. Instead of just being on the surface and looking at the natural for that next place you're going, there are moments of exhale where you are able to be fully immersed in who God is, who you are, and what he wants to do in you. And I'm praying for that for you today. Oftentimes we can come into these environments where the power of God is moving and because we are programmed to do, do, produce, 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 we take that mentality and we transfer it to, to, to this environment where it doesn't work. That's the point. Jesus created you and me to be able to receive him from a position of true rest, to be able to really breathe in life, to not be so tensed up by the next stressful thing that you're not gonna remember in six months, <laughs> the next frustration that you're gonna forget about in two weeks. But to be able to walk into this place, pause it all so that God can say, see, this is what you really needed. Take a deep breath. Take this moment in. Because when we're so hanging on to the jet ski, just trying to get, get there as fast as we possibly can, it is so easy to not only like, not enjoy the journey, but to miss an entire world of life beneath your feet that the world just wants to immerse you in. Amen? That's my prayer for you today. 
that you wouldn't come in here. I'm not trying to give you the next sizzling, mic dropping, coolest moment. I'm trying to take us back to AD 33, back to the early church where the spirit of God was moving in power and people were really experiencing and knowing what it means to be long to Jesus. Amen. Amen? Come on. I wanted to talk to you today about what you have in Christ, but I'm, only, I'm almost kind of hesitant sometimes when I see that when the Lord puts it on my heart to talk about, because when we talk about what we have, our brain flips back to like, you know, regular in the flesh life, and we're like, okay, I'm gonna take an inventory. And some of you, when I said what you have in Christ, you were like, I've got it all in me, and I am God's gift to the earth. For, for you, we'll pray. And then for the other people who look inside and you go, I don't have it. I don't know what's in there. He say what I have in Christ, I'm not sure I know what it is or how to access it or how to use it or, or, or any of those things. I want you to flip out of that mindset. Remember the jet ski, let go of the handle, friend. Let go of the handle. Don't make, don't make it be where your feet go over your ears and you hit the ground and you can't breathe. Let go and think about it from God's perspective about who you are is his. And so when we're talking about what you have in Christ, we're not talking about some ego-grabbing, self-absorbed thing where we're trying to lay a hold of something to be something. You're already significant. You matter. Jesus lives on the inside of you. Heaven paid the high, Father paid the highest price for you to have this access before the Lord. He gave it to you because you matter. You are significant before you ever performed and you were loved before you, you ever did things right or surrendered. God loved you. We love him because why? He first loved us. So we're gonna let it go and we're gonna think about it. When you say what we have in Christ, it means we're looking at the gift, the, the amazing, outrageously priced gift of Christ in you. And when you look at it, it's not to say you have this so you can be awesome. You look at it and you say, this amazing deposit from heaven is inside of me. I don't deserve it, but I know the Lord's called me to understand it, to look at it, and to walk in it. So when I say, what do you have? I'm not trying to make you prove something. I'm trying to make you look inward at the inventory, the spiritual inventory that the Lord has parked on the inside of you. Because some of us, we're skating through life so fast, we have no idea what's beneath our feet. We have no idea what's in the depths of who we are. And sometimes we won't even look at it. It's like that room in your basement where you shut the door and you forget about it. You're like, forget about it. And you throw the door, shut it. Forget about it. That's sometimes what we do with what the Lord's planted in us. We put it into our forget about it room for another time and then we never think about it again until you gotta move <laughs> or until the Lord breaks the walls down and you gotta move your stuff. So I wanna encourage you today. We're gonna talk about Acts one through four. I'm gonna be dipping in all those chapters. Pastor Steve has done such an excellent job opening the word, hasn't he? Digging into the early church. And so my goal is to touch on the, the past couple weeks that we've been going through so that when Pastor Steve comes back, he can dig into Acts five or say in four, whatever he wants to do, I'm, I'm here for it, buckle up. Um, but today I wanna talk to you about what you have in Christ going through the, the chapters one through four. So hey, open up your Bibles to Acts chapter one and I want to start off with talking about, gosh, the Lord really moved on that, so none of that was in my notes, so I gotta like tether us back in here for a second. So we're kind of in the middle of a culture storm, aren't we? You watch the news, <gasps> you watch anything on TV, <gasps> you see it everywhere, right? It makes me think about when me and Ashley first got married, we were living in this apartment in Brunswick and this wild storm hit. And so we had Josie at the time, I think she was like six months or something. We're looking out these double glass doors and there is a storm happening. Trees are like being blown over, like hanging on for dear life in the wind. And we're just enjoying it. And then right after it's over, we get a bunch of phone calls because apparently a tornado touched down right next to us <laughs> and ripped the roofs off the houses right on the other side of the tree line. And you know what, that's kind of like what's happening in culture right now, right? We're in our houses. We're seeing the roof come off of a lot of different places. Naturally, as we extend our prayers towards Florida, we saw some roofs come off, but we're seeing it culturally as well, aren't we? We're seeing it in church leaders who are just being exposed right now and stepping down. We're seeing it in Hollywood with like P. Diddy. We're seeing it politically. We're in a massive season of exposure, aren't we? And exposure, what's, I think we can all agree, doesn't feel great. 
No one likes to be exposed, right? And I think sometimes when we, we see a season of exposure happening, we can miss that God is in the exposure because it's uncomfortable. We don't like it. But God is in this exposure because Jesus promised that there would be. Like in Romans 12, he said, nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not become known. Whatever you said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you've whispered behind closed doors will be proclaimed from the housetops. We're in a moment where the truth is coming to light. So it's the perfect time for you and me to draw near to God so that we could shine before men that they may see the good works and glorify our Father in heaven, right? So let's keep pressing forward into this. Josie asked me at the table politically the other day. She goes, Dad, what's going to happen if my candidate doesn't win the election? <laughs> She's got opinions. My girl's got opinions on the Bible and politically all of it. And she said her candidate. And my first thought was like, I don't know how to answer this question. <laughs> but circle straight back to this. I told her, Josie, our hope is not in a political candidate, a political system, uh, an ideology, a way, a, a way that the country's operating right now. That's not where our hope exists. Our hope is in Christ. So no matter who gets elected, no matter what happens over the next year or so, we have one thing that we can be sure of. Our feet are planted on the rock of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news for you too? Our feet are planted on the rock no matter what's happening. Jesus is king. He has his own October surprise. <laughs> and, and what America needs right now is it needs a great awakening. And where does that start? I believe it's already started here in you. You're the great awakening, the start of it. So as we dig deeper into 8033 in the book of Acts, I want you to start to think about that mindset, that tension between we want to see the Lord come in power in our social structures. We wanna see it in our families, in our relationships, but we also wanna see it in other areas, like in our government. We want them to bless our government and bless our nation. That tension exists. And let me tell you, this is not an old conversation, which is why I pulled a clip from The Chosen that I want you to watch. So pay attention to James and John, okay? Let's get that up there. Thanks, Irene. Rabbi. Ah, you couldn't wait, could you? We're oh, sorry, we just uh, wanted to clear a few things up, if that's okay. By all means. So you Jewish boys are far from home. Yes, as a matter of fact, we are. Shalom to you, too. Here's our traditional Jewish greeting for you. <laughs> Don't lift a finger. That was a warning. Try it again and see what happens. Quiet, Big James. Shalom to you, too. <gasps> you filthy dogs! I said quiet. Let us do something. And what would that achieve? Defending your honor. They reviled and humiliated you. They deserve to have bolts of lightning rain down and incinerate them. Yes, fire from the heavens. Fire? You said we could do things like that. Say the word and it will happen. Why not? We knew we couldn't trust these people. We shouldn't have come here in the first place. They don't deserve you. Why do you think I had you work, Melek's field? What was I trying to teach you? To help? You think it was just to be more helpful? Or to be better farmers? It was to show you that what we're doing here will last for generations. What I told Fotina at the well, and what she then told so many others, it's sowing seeds that will have a lasting impact for lifetimes. Can you not see what's happening here? These people that you hate so much are believing in me without even seeing miracles. It's the message, the truth that we're giving them. And you're going to get in the way of that because a few people from a region you don't like were mean to you. That they're not worthy? What, you're so much better? You're more worthy? Well, let me tell you something. You're not. That's the whole point. It's why I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rabbi. As we gather others, I need you to help show the way. 
to be humble. We will. You wanted to use the power of God to bring down fire, to burn these people up? Well, it sounds a lot worse when you say it that way. <laughs> you too. You're like a storm on the sea. Thunder exploding out of your chests at every turn. <laughs> In fact, that's what I'm going to call you from now on. James and John, the sons of thunder. <laughs> oh, it's so good, isn't it? If you haven't checked out any of those episodes, you totally need to. They're amazing. Oh, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Um, and we're going to pick up at verse 3. And this is the Passion Translation. It says, after the sufferings of his cross. I do love how the King James Version says, after his passion. Jesus appeared alive many times to these same apostles over a 40-day period, proving to them with many convincing signs that he had been resurrected. And during these encounters, he taught them the truth of God's kingdom. Think about that. In that video, they were so fixated on Jesus' intervention into a political structure, you have to wonder, did the resurrected Jesus need 40 days to do an overhaul <laughs> to help them understand that he was after something more than healing a broken political scene? He was after a kingdom that would last for generations. Let's keep going in verse four. Jesus instructed them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait here until you receive the gift I told you about, the gift the Father has promised. For John baptized you in water but in a few days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Come on, when you hear about that, that probably had like mystery attached to it. They had all of their Jewish upbringing, and so they knew the history of the Spirit of God coming upon people, but the Holy Spirit living in somebody? Like John the Baptist promised, like baptism in fire? That's exciting. You'd probably be asking about that. They didn't. In verse 6, Every time they gathered together, they asked, Lord, is it now time for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Now remember, he has died, been resurrected, walking, talking, preaching, holes in the hand, holes in the side. And they're asking, when are you going to fix Israel? When are you going to rule the kingdom? And listen to his answer in verse 7. He said, the Father is the one who sets the fixed dates and times of their fulfillment. So catch that. He's not telling them that's not gonna happen because we know that God has an ultimate plan for the earth. He has a plan for the redemption of humanity through salvation, but he also has a plan for what's gonna happen in the nations of the earth. And the nations serve as vehicles for the purposes of God. He has always used them. You can look throughout all of history. You will see them. They're like little cars carrying the gospel, carrying the ultimate plans of God into fruition. Right? So the disciples aren't getting it. He's, and he answers so, with so much grace. He said, the dates and the fixed times, they're already going to happen. But you're not permitted to know the timing of all that he has prepared by his own authority. Back to my point. I promise you this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will be seized with power. And you'll be my messengers to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, the distant provinces, even to the remotest places on earth. In that video, we, we saw throughout the Gospels a depiction of James and John wanting to incinerate people with fire. <laughs> and we see even after the resurrection, we're still asking the question, Lord, how are you going to invade into this political structure that we really want to see a breakthrough in? When will you liberate from these oppressors or these people who are holding this over us? When is this going to happen? That conversation has been going up to the throne of heaven for all of humanity, and it will continue to do so. And I'm not saying that's not a worthy request, because we know that God has an ultimate plan for the nations that he is working all of history towards. It will happen. But when Jesus was talking 
talking to his disciples about what we are to do. He did not tell them anything to do with those plans. He said, fixate on this. Be yielded to God, seized with the power of the Holy Spirit, and spread the gospel. That's what he asked them to do. Even when they kept asking over and over again, when will you fix Israel? When will you touch our political system? He always came back to this. The gospel is the Father's answer for you. Spread it. So what happens? We go on to Acts chapter two and verse one. I'll give you a second to get there. On the day Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place, kind of like this place. I wonder if they had someone like Allison singing Revelation song. That would have been cool. So suddenly, they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. The roar of wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. And then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. Pause there for a second. A pillar of fire. Isn't that just the coolest thing as we've been a part of our Flourish community going through the Bible together throughout this year? It makes me think of Exodus when the Israelites were guided out of Egypt and into the wilderness and they followed a pillar of fire. And that pillar of fire, which was heavy with the presence of God and symbolism for Jewish people for generations, was a prophetic picture of what God was about to do in this moment in Acts 2, the pillar of fire became the pillar of fire of the Holy Spirit. Not that the, the fire that didn't just lead people through the desert, but the fire that rested on them, lived on the inside of them. The pillar of fire came and it separated, as you can see as we continue reading, it separated in the tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. And they were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit, to speak in languages they'd never learn. And something clicked. Something clicked. And Peter stepped up. Now, for us, this is thousands of year, thousands of year old history, right? But for Peter, we're talking months. Peter had just denied Jesus in that courtyard a couple months ago and been restored by Jesus. Their whole world is just an upheaval as their resurrected Lord just taught them about the kingdom and now he's preaching the message, right? I wanna remind you about something very kind of cool here. What is one of the most powerful memory triggers that you can experience? It's your sense of smell, right? So you can smell, if you smell, like if you have a grandma or a, or a mother who passed away and you smell that perfume, it's almost like it takes you right back to that moment, right? Or think about, um, gosh, for me, it's my, my grandma's basement. It smelled like neglect. <laughs> That's the only word for it. <laughs> and so I was, one time when I was working at Starbucks, I went to the basement to take boxes and I was like, I know the smell. <laughs> As I went down the stairs of the basement, I was like, this is my Mimi's house. <laughs> the, the scent took me right back. And why am I talking about this? It's, it's, it's actually really cool. When Peter denied Jesus in the courtyard, the scripture is intentional. It tells us that he was standing next to a charcoal fire. And how many of y'all know what charcoal smells like? Any grill masters in the room today online? You know what charcoal smells like. I know there's some of you here. Um, it's a really distinct smell. And so I wonder before Peter, if Peter had never been restored by Jesus, that if for the rest of his life when he smelled that charcoal, he would be taken back to that moment where he denied Christ and walked away. When Peter gets restored, he's doing what he knew to do before. Can you imagine that? If you've, if you've ever had a call or a destiny from God that, you were, that he, maybe by the hand of the Lord or other reasons, you got pulled out of and you had to go back to what you were doing before. Or maybe you lost your dream job and you had to go do something else you didn't wanna do. This is what Peter is feeling. He was a part of Jesus' ministry, seeing the miraculous pour out, seeing the power and presence of God heal masses. And now in just a short span of time, it's all over. And he has no idea what to do except go back to what he was doing before. And so he was fishing. And from the shoreline, Jesus says, hey, throw your nets on the other side for a catch. 
And Peter recognizes his voice, leaps out of the boat, and comes to Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? He's grilling fish on a charcoal fire. So my point is this. Is it possible that God cared so much about Peter that he knew that his memory would be attached to that charcoal fire smell and would think about failure and, and, and letting Jesus down and, and, and all of these things crumbling around him, that in his love when he restored Peter, he didn't just ask him if he loved him three times to restore him that way. He redeemed the actual smell of charcoal for Peter. That now when he smells that fire and that fish, he'll think about being restored. And, and my whole point is this, that some of you here today you have had things in your past. You've got a BC in your life, a before Christ. And you have things that you're ashamed about that you would, you would consider to be receipts or lists proving that you're not, that God shouldn't use you in the way that, that he may be calling you to move in. That maybe these lists disqualify me. But what the Lord does in his love is he takes that charcoal fire that existed in shame and he redeems it with restoration by saying what you failed at, what separated you from God back then is what you will have authority in at, after he restores you. What you failed in, what, where you let God down, where you feel like it cannot be redeemed, that the Lord will remove that shame and replace it with authority. So some of y'all were looking for your call and you've been looking somewhere outside of your past or your failures or your histories. Let me tell you something. God is in those two and he wants to redeem you completely. He wants to look at your past and your history, pour his presence all over it, and take you into a place where you understand that the breakthrough you've been contending for exists when you understand that the failure has been transformed by the power of God into a victory in your life. You've got authority. Isn't that good? It's so good. So Peter gets up after all of this, something clicks in him, and he starts to preach. We're back in Acts. He's preaching to thousands, and thousands are coming into the kingdom. His healing was so complete that he was able to call others into the freedom that Jesus gave him, which is what I want to remind you of. <sighs> you can't give away what you don't have. And so when you think about what you have in Christ, it's imperative that you look in and you recognize what it is, not just for you, but so that you can give it away to other people. Give it away to your kids, to your spouse, to your family members. Only when you fully understand who you are in Christ and what you have, can you fully give it away to others. That's why you gotta look. So we've got Peter preaching, smelling the charcoal and giving away what God gave him. And we keep moving forward into Acts chapter three where Pastor Steve preached, I think it was two weeks ago, about the healing of the man at the gate called Beautiful and the persecution that followed. So Peter and John walked by this man who was crippled since birth, and when he asked for money, what'd they say? Y'all know this. Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, repeat, what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk, and the whole place erupts. And Peter preaches again. And the coolest part about this moment is it was 3 p.m. prayer, so it would be kind of like an, our normal service and somebody coming in and just totally disrupting it with a healing, except we'd be bonkers about it. We're, we're very excited about that. <laughs> but it's breaking up the 3 p.m. prayer, and it freaked people out. So what happens when people get freaked out? They call the police, and they get somebody arrested. So that's what happened here. They arrest uh, Peter and John, and, and, they, and they take him to Annas and Caiaphas, the priests who were instrumental in the crucifixion of Jesus. And, and these guys, they ask, they ask the apostles in Acts 4, 7, tell us by what power and authority have you done these things? And Peter never wanted to miss an opportunity. He preaches again. And you can see in Acts, uh, circle back there to Acts 3, verse 14. After he preached, it says that Annas and Caiaphas began to understand the effect Jesus had on them simply by spending time with them. Standing there with them was a healed man, and there was nothing they could say. So Peter and John are released because they couldn't find a valid reason or crime to punish them for. So they gather the church together, and the church prayed. And, you know, here at Bethel, but I believe in other churches throughout the nation right now, 
I think that the Lord is calling up the intercessors and the remnant to come and pray. I think that we're in a moment, a brush fire moment here. And the intercessors, to me, you know, they're, they're kind of smoky. They're hot to the touch. And <laughs> usually in some kind of coal pit. <laughs> And the breath of the Spirit is breathing on those coals right now, and it's waking up intercession in the church. It's one of the reasons why we're pushing really hard into it by having Friday morning prayer for the nation. Every Friday from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. until Inauguration Day, we're gonna be praying together. I wanna invite you to come to that. And then we also have our Monday nights starting up with Kim Snyder for our intercessory prayer starting, I think this month, Michael, in October. Yeah, it's coming up. So the church gets together in Acts 4, and they pray. But they're not praying from a defeated posture. There is something about the freshness of what the Holy Spirit poured out. They knew who they were. And when they saw their leaders being persecuted, it didn't make them shrink back in fear. They understood that what they carried, that what Jesus had given them was worth being persecuted for, worth dying for. So they had already laid their lives down. They took it literally when Paul was writing that I've been crucified with Christ and it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. They took it seriously and they dug into it. It. They didn't get in their prayer meeting and talk about how bad things were or how things were going to turn around, but they came together and they asked the Lord for more. And that's where we are as a church. We're in a moment where the presence of God is hovering over this. It's almost like a Kairos open window moment that if we will access this, like the early church did when the persecution came, when the difficulty came, if we will access this revelation of who we are and what we have in Christ, then we will see an outpouring of the Spirit, I believe, unlike we have experienced yet. We will see the Lord come in power in our businesses, in our schools, in our government, everything we're asking for. But if we access him, if we pray and we ask for the right things. A great example is in Acts 4 here in verse 30. This is the, the early church's response to the persecution. They say, so now, Lord, listen to their threats to harm us. Empower us as your servants to speak the word of God freely and courageously. Stretch out your hand of power through us to heal and to move in signs and wonders by the name of your holy son, Jesus. And as they prayed, the earth shook beneath them, causing the building they were in to tremble. And each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit and they proclaimed the word of God with unrestrained boldness. How many unrestrained boldness people are here today? I love all six of you. <laughs> that word for unrestrained boldness is called parousia. And what it means is it's more than confidence. It's a free flowing and unrestrained boldness. You know, it can also mean freedom of speech. That's a fun buzzword for right now. <laughs> and the person who speaks with parousia this is, you can read all this. It's a great note from Brian Simmons. Just dig into it in more detail. I'm just giving you kind of the surface top view. The person who speaks with this says everything that's on their mind without restraint, flowing from the heart with confidence. So this, this thing that came on them, and it didn't say it came on just Peter. It came on just John. It said that this unrestrained boldness came on the whole church as they asked for it. Parousia, which is more than just being bold and being confident. It's the ability to speak from heart to heart, bypassing almost the intellect, speaking exactly what you're thinking, unrestrained, fully going with it, and speaking and having an anointing to not just speak to people's minds, but to speak heart to heart. It's like the Lord puts his hand on their hearts, connects it to their mouth, and it's like a, a spear or a javelin that hits the mark right in the heart of the other person. That's the anointing that they're talking about. They, they were able to move and speak with unrestrained boldness, but flowing from heart to heart, words that would transform people. That is what is accessible to you. Parousia, they prayed and the earth shook beneath them. Everything they asked for, the Lord granted them in that prayer. Each one of them was filled with the Spirit. And what do you have when somebody next to you or in your family or your relationships is physically or emotionally or spiritually crippled? We have those people next to us. And the Lord, let me tell you something. The Lord did not plant those people next to you for your pity or that you would grow in compassion alone. He planted those people next to you because he gave you the power and authority to do something about it. 
So there's people around you, physically, spiritually, emotionally crippled. And what do you have? You have this thing in you, parasia, parasia, living on the inside of you. That if you will understand, you look in, what do I have in Christ? I look in and you hear parasia. And you speak out heart to heart. And you speak words that transform. Let me tell you something. When the Lord gives you that anointing and you begin to operate in it, it's not something that puffs your brain up because it's almost like you, you become hyper aware that the effectiveness of what's happening in this moment, the way that the Lord is moving, the way that the Lord is speaking, the transformation that he is doing is the spirit of God. It is not the effort of flesh or striving or trying to be awesome. It is about yielded submission, being seized with power, walking in the grace of the Lord to speak out things that will release transformation in people's lives. And some of you are like, I can't, I can't do that. I would rather die than give a public presentation. No one's asking you to do that. Well, I mean, I guess scripture does ask us to die, but I mean, but as far as speaking, as far as speaking, the Lord's only asking you to love the person in front of you, just like Heidi Baker says, love the one. And to allow that unrestrained boldness to come out and speak heart to heart. In Acts 4, the disciples prayed that they would speak it freely and courageously. So in Christ, you've got true freedom. True freedom. You know, the whole world, they have this bogus version of freedom. Do whatever you want. Gratify the desires of the flesh. Sleep with who you want. Eat what you want. Don't take care of your body. Do all this stuff. And and it's all about in the name of um, acceptance and tolerance. And do whatever you want. It's good. But let me tell you something. That is not freedom. Because when the Lord gives you the eyeballs to see how things actually are, do you know what that, it says that in Proverbs, that true wisdom is the ability to look at information and draw right conclusions? So the Lord gives you an anointing to be able to look at something and see it as it actually is. And so when we look at freedom, you and I both know, if I want to do something, if I want to get married, like I did, love you, honey. <laughs> um, I can't, I, I'm losing autonomy. I don't get to just go and do whatever I want whenever I want. I'm not just gonna disappear for weeks on end and tell her, well, it's my freedom, and if you can't deal with it, then I'm sorry. I would never, I'd be too scared, but you know, even, <laughs> even just then I felt like. <laughs> but because I do have the freedom to make decisions in my life, I can choose to follow Jesus, I can choose who I wanna marry, I can do all that. I chose her because I chose her That means I'm not free to just do whatever. That means I'm not free to, (laughs) you're committed to that person. You can't marry somebody else. I know some people do in the US, there's shows about it, but we don't. (laughs) But with that, yes, like everything that me and Ashley have built together, our house, our, our family, all of that, all of that comes with saying no to other things and other options. So being free doesn't mean you get to do whatever crosses your mind or to be driven by your impulses because some of y'all be in big trouble. (laughs) But what do you do when like, if freedom's doing whatever you want, what do you do if what you want contradicts another one? Do you see how it doesn't work? So like if you want to be a bodybuilder, I'm not saying I'm trying to be. I'm like mid-level trying to be. (laughs) But... If you're gonna do that, that means you're gonna have to eat differently. You're gonna have to sleep differently. You're gonna have to go to the gym. (laughs) You're gonna have to do all those things. That means that you're not gonna be able to stay up all night eating Taco Bell and then be okay. You're you're saying no to those desires because I love Taco Bell. I feel like it's okay in this house because Pastor Steve has the, you said Taco Bell! So I feel like Taco Bell's blessed, (laughs) pre-blessed. But if I want to be a bodybuilder, I'm saying no to those things, those other desires, because true freedom isn't necessarily doing whatever I want. True freedom is recognizing that for me to walk in this liberty in Christ means that I will lay down these other things that are inferior, all these other desires. I will put to the side and I will choose the better thing. True freedom is saying I am embracing the kind of constraints that will produce what I am aiming for. So if I'm trying to live for Christ, that means I'm going to live righteous 
consciously. That means I'm going to spend time in the word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm gonna make spiritual disciplines and rhythms a part of my life, not an add-on, not something I do when I'm only in difficulty or when I'm not distracted, but I'm going to take these things, incorporate them into my life, even when I don't feel like it, because I am aiming to win this race. I am, I'm not shadow boxing here like Paul said. I'm wanting to win the prize, so I'm following Christ as somebody who wants to win, not somebody who's just trying to be in the middle of the crowd like, <sighs> I used to do that in cross country in high school. You know, I just didn't want to be in the back of the pack, so as long as I'm in the middle, uh, uh, that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to win, right? And let me tell you something, you're a winner. Christ lives in you. Every single person in this room today, you're part of Bethel, you're a winner. Can you say that to me, I'm a winner? Can you say it one more time? One more time like you actually mean it? Yeah. So you have, what do you have in Christ? You've got parousia. You've got true freedom. You've got courage. I mean, somebody just cackled, I hope you do. <laughs> You've got courage. You have, you have the, the ability to, to make the decisions that will lead you into Christ's will for your life. Because something you gotta recognize is this. What you want the most is what you worship. And what you worship controls you. You can ask anybody, if you've ever known an addict, somebody who suffered through that, they will tell you that at the height of their addiction, their family didn't matter to them. They were just gonna get that fix. They were focused on it. That desire which started out as a want became something that controlled them. And that's the biggest lie that the world sells you is that by indulging in whatever your impulses or desires are, you'll be free. Actually, it's the inside out lie from hell because if you go for those things that take you away from Christ, they will control you. But if we submit to Christ, if we give our lives to Jesus, that's true freedom because then we're able to live for him. We're not held back by bondages or the things that destroy our lives or our families or our relationships. We are centered on a God who is perfect, loving, and just and directing you into your best life. So submitting to him is amazing. It's the best thing that you'll ever do. And I'm so glad for the freedoms, I, the things that I could do that I've surrendered to follow Christ. I don't spend a single day regretting it because I know who God is and that he is way better than anything I'm leaving behind. And I know that you know it too. Mm. We're gonna bring this thing in for a landing. I wanna say that only through the surrender of our desires and wants can we prioritize what matters most to us in life. Only when we lay our life down to Christ can we prioritize him. So you have true freedom in Christ. You've got courage, just like they prayed for in Acts 4.29, just like Peter demonstrated when he stood up and he used to be a person of fear a couple months ago who denied the Lord and then led thousands and thousands to Christ. You have dunamis power. Have you ever heard that word before? I'm not sure if I'm saying it 100% right. But the Greek word, it actually means dynamite. It means that it multiplies itself. That's the kind of power that you've got living on the inside of you. And some of you are walking around feeling like powerless people. And I gotta tell you, that is a lie from hell. You are a powerful person. You have the power, the most power of the spirit on the inside of you that multiplies on itself. It's powerful. You're powerful and you're scary to hell. So when you walk around and you hear that whisper of the spirit in your ear to pray for somebody and your heart starts to pound, you're like, I don't know if I can do it, Lord. It's like my first time treasure hunting back in 2011, 13 or something like that. I followed this woman around a Marks where I was like. <laughs> and then she's looking at like, I don't know, staples or something. I'm like pretending to be really interested. We, we, we allow that fear to control us, but you know, the truth is when you recognize who Christ is and you allow that motivation to not be again, remember I told you earlier about jet skiing? Let go again, sink deeper. This isn't about you doing what you're supposed to do. This isn't about just even following commandments. 
It is about allowing the love of God to permeate your being to the point where you see people the way that he does. And then when you minister to them, you're not fearful because you're not doing it to feed your significance. You're full of faith because you're looking at them and you feel the love of God and your motivation has flipped and you're looking at it differently and you're ministering to this person because you understand that Jesus died for them and you feel it in your bones. That's why we do it. Where we're going after something bigger, deeper, and better than just doing a checklist, amen? Than just trying to be good enough, that measuring stick can go straight back to hell where it came from. Because God came in and he set you free completely and he has something better for you. So you have courage, you've got freedom, you've got power, you've got access, like it says in Hebrews 4, you can approach the throne with boldness, and you've got grace. The Lord's inviting you into rhythms of grace. And what can God do with somebody who is redeemed, courageous, truly free, powerful, accessible, and fresh? He can do a lot. <laughs> Joel. <laughs> he can do a lot. Anything he wants to. So what do you have? You've got all that he is and all that he has. You have true freedom, courage, power, access, and grace. But I wanna to talk to you about, I wanna to talk to you about going back to the basics. We're gonna bring it in for Landy. I'm gonna ask for our, our band to come back up so we can bring it home. You know, Peter said in Acts 3.19 that you have to repent and turn back to God so that your sins will be removed and so that times of refreshing from the Lord's presence can come. And that word for repentance, it does mean to turn back and to change the way you think. But Hebraic thought interprets it as coming home. So I want you to think, it's more than a change of mind. It's a return to coming home to God. Like the prodigal son, repentance wasn't only apologizing, it was coming home. True repentance wasn't just apologizing, it was taking the ring and the party too. It was being celebrated while being undeserving. It's not just about works, it's about allowing the Lord to love you to completion, love you to wholeness. And some of you today, you may be fully redeemed in Christ. You may, have, you may have a great awareness of what's on the inside of you, but you haven't allowed the Lord to necessarily put his ring on your finger and celebrate you because you're ashamed. And I feel like that's the last lie of the enemy, that is last ditch effort when somebody gives himself to Christ is to allow shame to continue to hover over them in those areas that the Lord is wanting to heal and redeem. You know, we, we go to those rooms in our heart, we shut the door and we turn off the lights and we pretend that if we ignore it long enough that it will, it'll just disappear. But ultimately at the end of the day, the only thing that is going to redeem that hurt, that wound, that darkness in your life is the Lord opening the door and the light turning on. And you'll be surprised that in the flooding of his light, the shame disappears as quickly as the darkness. And you can see yourself as you actually are in him. Loved, held, redeemed. And that ring that he wanted to put on your finger is no longer a shame, but it becomes an honor to say yes to. And then the party that comes doesn't feel like sorrow. Your mind clicks like Peter and you get it and you realize this was always about him. And it's not celebrating necessarily just me and how, how I've just come back, but it's about the Lord having his desire fulfilled, which was me, you coming back the desire of the Lord. All of this, all of this structure, all the universe, everything he's done, the flow of history, the way the gospels traveled, all came down to this moment, this one desire that God wanted you. He wanted you and he was willing to pay any price to have you. He was willing to suffer that death on the cross and be resurrected. He was willing to do whatever it took to have you. There was nothing that could stop him. Nothing could get in his way. You were worth it all. And so when you return to him and he wants to put the ring on your finger, stop making it about you and allow it to be about him. The God who is worthy of praise, worthy of it all, wants you. And when he puts that ring on your finger, let it live there for the rest of your life and into eternity that you were bought with a price, you belong to Jesus. 
and he is worthy of the party. So don't be a downer. Embrace the party. <laughs> Embrace him. Could you stand on your feet with me today? I wanna invite our ministry teams to come forward. And please just hang with me for just another couple of minutes. I don't want you to miss this. I believe that there are some people here today that you are saved and you know the Lord and you love him deeply, but there are areas of shame and darkness in your life that have prevented you from fully walking in the calling of who you are. They've held you back from your boldness and, and, and being uh, fully aware of the power, but held you back from even experiencing and enjoying the, the depth and glory of his presence. And so I wanna invite you today, if you need to be restored, you want that ring on your finger and you want the party to be just thrown in heaven, I want you to just come up right now across the front of this altar. I'm gonna give you a minute to make your way forward. But if you want the Lord to come in and to pour out his presence, even if you're totally fine, I'm just saying, if you wanna come up to the table like Joel is right now, <laughs> Come on forward, and I want our ministry teams to pray for you. I have a, a, something I want to declare over you in just a moment, but Allison's going to sing this chorus as you make your way forward. When I was in need, you out Come on, lift your hands, just listen. Let it wash over you. Thought I was too far gone. You stood there. Come on, he wants to restore you this morning. Are you tired? He wants to give you rest. Come on. There's a window opening in the heavens right now. If you need a touch from the Lord, just lift up your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that when you looked at me, you wanted me. That when you looked at my life, you knew everything that I would ever do and you wanted me, you chose me. Lord, each person here today, you wanted them, you chose them. You structured their life and put the right people in the right places because you wanted them. And now here they are, yours completely. And Lord, I pray that you would just release right now the holy roar of heaven, that you would pour out your spirit over them, Lord, and that that light that floods their being right now would remove the sting of shame and the darkness of sin. Lord, I pray that you would light them up right now and that they would look around at their life and look around at themselves and not see shame, disappointment, or loss, but they would look in and see the fullness and completeness of Christ. That they would look in and see the fullness of Jesus and realize that my life is so much more than a task I'm doing this side of heaven. My life, my call, my destiny is to belong to Jesus, is to be be His. And so, Lord, I surrender my life. We surrender our lives as a church at Bethel, Lord. May this always be a place where your presence can rest, where your presence and your glory can fill us. Lord, I pray that prophetic words and promises would pop like popcorn throughout this whole room right now, God, that you would let your words just sink deep and rest on them. God, I thank you for the healing of those who are in grieving or in mourning or loss. Lord, that you are our peace, that you are our redemption. And Lord, I thank you for the brush fire that you're about to light with the intercessors and your people here. Lord, I pray that the next six months there would be an outpouring of your spirit unlike we've ever seen. Lord, that you would pour out your glory and that we would sense and know your nearness. And Lord, that we would just have stories that we would share with our grandchildren that would go for generations about when the Lord came. Lord, we surrender our lives and I bless every single person here today to be full of the Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Everyone said, amen. I wanna thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're gonna continue ministering. If you wanna get prayed for or, or get a piece of that word, come on up here and we're gonna continue to let this song go for a couple times, guys. But for the rest of you, if you need to go, be, be released. We bless you. Have an amazing week. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for listening to our Sermon of the Week. You can help us reach others by investing today at BethelCleveland.com slash give.